أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of God, most merciful, ever merciful, and may God's peace and blessings be upon his holy prophet Muhammad and the purified members of his household and progeny. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajjal farajahum. Assalamu alaik ya Aba Abdullah wa ala al-arwah allati hallat bifinaik. Alaykum minni jami'an salamu Allahi abadan ma baqitu wa baqiya al-laylu wa al-nahar. ولا جعله الله آخر العهد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين Respected sisters, dear brothers, السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته There should be no doubt that Islam has a very rich tradition, very, tri very rich heritage in considering a number of locations, a number of sites as carrying special significance. In fact, there should be no doubt that Islam considers certain sites, certain locations to carry not only significance and importance, but holiness and sanctity. The question is therefore to try to understand why is it that certain locations, certain sites are given this type of importance in our religion? Where does this holiness come from? What is it attributable to? And given this holiness, given this sanctity, the importance given by Islam to these types of sites, what is therefore our duty, our responsibility? What are the Islamic teachings surrounding these types of holy sites? Today, inshallah, we're going to try to look at a few verses of the Holy Quran and some of the narrations of Ahlul Bayt alayhum as -salam, to try to understand specifically what Islam has to say about some of these sites that we consider to be holy. And we want to focus our attention on one type of site specifically, and that is the mosque. The mosque being the best representative for these types of sites. The sanctity and the holiness of these locations is not limited to mosques, but as we said, it is the best example for us to look at to understand these notions in a practical manner, because some of these notions are a little bit abstract. And this is once again a topic that would require a much lengthier discussion than we have time for. We are therefore simply trying to focus on the areas that are perhaps, inshallah, most relevant and important to us. If we begin by trying to focus on where the holiness and the sanctity of these locations and these sites comes from, the best clues that we have are found in the functions that are performed by these sites. What is the role of this site? What role does it perform in society, in a community, in the world? The better we understand the functions that are performed, the better we have an insight into understanding why our religion considers these sites to be holy. This is where the sanctity comes from. And this, of course, is at the logical or rational level. Otherwise, there's always a ritualistic level or a purely religious level where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala simply tells you that something is holy and you consider it to be holy. Our discussion is trying to understand a little bit of the philosophy behind it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not ask us to do things that are entirely random. There's always a greater wisdom behind it. So let's start by looking at some verses of the Holy Quran to provide a quick overview at first. The first verse of the Holy Quran comes to us from Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 125. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذْ جَعَلْنَا الْبَيْتَ مَثَابَةً لِلنَّاسِ وَأَمْنَا وَاتَّخِذُوا مِن مَقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ مُصَلَّى وَعَهِدْنَا إِلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْمَاعِيلَ أَن طَهِّرَ بَيْتِيَ لِلطَّائِفِينَ وَالْعَاكِفِينَ وَالرُّكَّعِ السُّجُودِ 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this verse, and remember when we made the house a place of constant return and assembly for humankind and a sanctuary. Take then, take then the station of Ibrahim as your place of prayer. And we commanded Ibrahim and Ismail saying, purify my house for those who circle it, who circumambulate it, those who retreat to it, and those who bow down and prostrate. What does this verse tell us? We're talking about mosques in general. This verse is talking about a very specific mosque, the greatest of all mosques. This is the Kaaba. The verse is talking about a specific mosque, but at the same time, if we understand what it says about this mosque, then we can see how these teachings and these functions performed by this holiest of mosques can apply in common and in general to other mosques. So what does this verse say? The verse starts by saying, وَإِذْ جَعَلْنَا الْبَيْتَ We made the house. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose this term to talk about a mosque? Why did He call it a bait? We're translating it in English as a house. House is not a really good translation for a bait. In Arabic, the root of this term, bait, means this is the location where you spend your night. This is the location where you go to rest. If you want to find peace and calm and serenity, if you want to heal psychologically and spiritually, you retreat back to a location where you spend the night. You perform mabit or baytute in a bait. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses that same term to talk about mosques. He refers to the Kaaba, the holiest of the mosques, as being a bait. Not a bait, as the bait. As they say, par excellence. The best, most perfect version of a bait is al Kaaba which already gives us the first function that is supposed to be performed by mosques. You attend the mosque so that spiritually you find peace and you find rest and you find serenity and calm. You calm your soul by attending the mosque. This is the first function. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses this term. وَإِذْ جَعَلْنَا الْبَيْتَ مَثَابَةً In Arabic this term means that you constantly return back to something. And the construction of the verse, the way the wording is put together, means that this is where people are going to constantly return in groups. This is where people assemble. You return back in groups. When we made the house, this place where you come to rest, a place for you to constantly go back to, in groups. And the next word informs us of this. Linnas. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that there's a collective dimension here. You don't perform this act as an individual. You, pour you perform this act as a group. You are part of a group of people bigger than yourself. This is how you return to the mosque. So when we made the mosque or we made the house, a place of constant return for humankind. وَأَمْنَا And a sanctuary where you go for safety and protection. And this is something that was part of the teachings and the culture and the beliefs even in pre-Islamic Arabia. Anyone who wanted to find sanctuary, they may perform a crime. If they want protection, they don't want to be harmed by anyone. They go in a safe sanctuary, which is the Kaaba. And no one can harm them. They wait for them to leave the Kaaba so that they may capture them and exercise whatever justice they think is fit. And Islam preserved this. And this is part of Islamic teachings. Islam recognized 
these teachings and this belief as being valid. So this is another function performed by these places. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاتَّخِذُوا مِن مَقَامِ إِبْرَاهِيمَ مُصَلَّى I will skip the parts that are specific to the Kaaba. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that these places are places for prayer. Musalla means this is a place where you stand to perform your ritual prayers. And this should be the most obvious part of mosques. So I won't comment on it anymore. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, We asked Ibrahim and Ismail, أَن طَهِّرَا بَيْتِيَ Purify this house of mine. This purity of the place is at two levels. It can mean that you purify it in a material way. If there's any najasa, you remove the najasa. Or it could be something a lot more spiritual. There should be no false beliefs here. There should be no batil that enters this type of place. There should be no indecency, no sinfulness. Nothing wrong should enter this type of place. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I took an oath from Ibrahim and Ismail to clean up this place, to make it pure. For whom? للطائفين, this is specific to the Kaaba, those who perform the tawaf, who circumambulate, who, per, who circle the Kaaba. والعاكفين. What is the i'tikaf in Arabic? It's when you retreat, you isolate yourself so that you can meditate without distractions. You can focus on your acts of worship, your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is one of the recommended acts, for instance, in the month of Ramadan. There's i'tikaf, that is mustahab. The Holy Prophet would leave his bed and would spend the last 10 days and 10 nights of the month of Ramadan in the mosque in worship. This is i'tikaf. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the people who are coming to the mosque in general as being in this state. We're not performing this state for days and weeks. We're performing this state for a couple of hours. But it means that we have to be able to focus without distractions on the purpose of these types of gatherings. To meditate, to reflect, to think. What else? sujud, And those who bow down and perform prostration. Ruku' and sujood. And they re perform this repeatedly. A lot of it. Already with this verse, we can see that there's perhaps a lot more going on in a mosque than we may think at first glance. The functions that the mosque is performing is a lot more than simply attending to assemble together or attend to perform an act of worship. Let's look at second verse. In this second verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 96, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إن أول بيت وضع للناس للذي ببكة مباركا وهدى للعالمين. The first house, or surely the first house established for humankind, was the one at بكة. And we're going to come to this term, full of blessing and a guidance for the worlds or for humankind. I won't talk about the beginning of the verse. It talks again about the house. We talked about the house. And we know which house it's referring to. Once again, it's talking about the Kaaba. Once again, it's talking about the holiest of sanctuaries in Islam. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, This is established. It's established for humankind. There's a lot of meaning behind this word. First, it means... That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is establishing it for humankind. This is not something for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though we call it a house of God. The purpose is for humankind, not for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It must therefore perform functions and duties and be at the service of humankind. This is very important for mosques. Mosques are here to serve. Houses of God are here to serve. And we must ensure that they perform this function. Then clearly the verse says, they are places of blessing, as it says, Mubarakan wahudan, and places of guidance. This is somewhere you go to receive guidance, to be educated, 
to access the truth. This is the meaning of guidance. Either that it means it points the truth to you or it means it brings you to the truth. But this is guidance. And a blessing. Meaning that whatever is good in your life multiplies. Those things that matter increase. This is the meaning of blessing. This is what we expect and these are the functions of the mosque. And then the Quran says, specifically the one at Bekka. What does Bekka mean? If you follow the majority of the commentators of the Holy Quran, they say that Bekka, either because of the Arabic language, which allows to change the letter Mim into Ba and the letter Ba into Mim for eloquence and other reasons, or because this is an accent of some of the tribes of the Arabs where this verse was revealed. And so the Holy Quran revealed this verse using this term. Bekka, which is the term that they used to call Mecca, those tribes. So the Quran was revealed because it was revealed in those tribes at that location, it was revealed in their accent. This is the majority opinion. If you go back to Imam Sadiq, he gives another answer. He says, Bekka is the name of the location of the Kaaba. The exact spot where the Kaaba is is called Bekka. And the Kaaba is inside a small town. The town is Mecca. And the location of the Kaaba in that town is called Bekka. Regardless, it doesn't change anything. This is simply to say why the Holy Quran is using this term specifically. Then we have to focus on the fact that the Holy Quran is talking not about any mosque, it's talking about the Kaaba. The Kaaba being the holiest, the greatest of all mosques, all holy sites in Islam. What does it say about it? It says that this is the first house established for humankind. Here it can mean two things. The first meaning is that this is the first house of worship established for humankind. And if we go back to the narrations, and we want to see, is it truly the first house? We find that the narration is telling us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered Prophet Adam alayhi salam to build the Kaaba. And he built the Kaaba. And the Kaaba remained in place until the time of Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. And then it got destroyed in the flood. And it remained in that state being destroyed until the time of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered Ibrahim alayhi salam in his old age when he had his son Ismail alayhi salam old enough to rebuild the Kaaba based on the foundation that was there. That's why the Quran is very precise. It says, وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدِ There's already a qa'id. There's already a base and a foundation. Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam came back to rebuild it in the exact same spot where Prophet Adam السلام, had built it. This is the first house of worship. But there could perhaps be more. If we put aside religion, we always try to make these linkages. We need to think about it in different ways, perhaps that expands our horizons. Today on the religious side, we have these narrations. They talk about the cycle of prophethood, how this construction had history comes down to us all the way from Prophet Adam alayhi salam. The Holy Quran spends a lot of time explaining to us how it was built by Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam and that entire heritage, which includes Al Hajar al Aswad, the black stone, and it was supposed to represent to us that perhaps there is nothing left from the original Kaaba today in that building except that stone. That stone having been there from the original construction of the Kaaba. And its significance is that it represents the millennia of human beings who have been devoted to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who have come from far and wide to continue to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so when you come to the black stone, you are telling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you are part of this gigantic chain of worshippers and believers and prophets and messengers who have all stood by the covenant that we have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
And this is what this black stone represents. But if we put all of this aside, let's turn to human history by looking at this verse. It says the first house that was put together. What does the documented and well approved, the formal version of human history say about the earliest beginnings of human life? For those who study human history, archaeology, there is a trend. If you go back and look at the oldest, and I'm talking about formally recognized textbook history, at the oldest buildings and sites that exist today in the world, you will find a trend. There's something common to all of them. The common factor in all of the oldest sites that we have in the world is that they all are either temples or they contain a temple. They are places of worship or they have a place of worship within them. And this is a very important point. Whether you're looking in Africa or Asia or Latin America, these sites that are thousands upon thousands of years old, all of them are either temples or they have a temple. They are places of worship. The oldest site formally recognized today is called Gobleki Tepe. This is a site in Turkey. It is 11,600 years old. This is the oldest site formally recognized in human history as being a human building built entirely by human beings with purpose and design and architecture and engineering. A lot older than anything else. 11,600 years from today. It was used for 1,500 years. That, that's a very long time to use. And when they compare it to other sites, it is truly astounding what they find. How old it is, is already astounding. It's difficult for us to imagine this time, the length of time of 11,600 years. For reference and comparison, Stonehenge is the most famous of such sites. Stonehenge was 5,000 years ago. This site is 7,000 years older. This site is 50 times the size of Stonehenge. It's 22 acres wide. You can fit around 90 soccer fields in it. This is the size of that site. In terms of civilization, the oldest civilizations known today, the oldest civilization is the Sumerian civilization in Mesopotamia in present-day Iraq. It emerged around 6,000 years ago. This site is 6,000 years older than Sumeria. And when they looked using radars and other technology to see what to excavate and how big it is and how much they can find, they found all sorts of things that are unexplainable to them. For instance, and they have already excavated 15, 17 more of these pillars. They're gigantic pillars that are entirely carved. They look like the letter T. Each one of these weighs about 10 tons, 22,000 pounds. None of these are from that location, so they have to be transported there. And they are perfectly carved. They're called megaliths. A megalith is it's not like today where you pour concrete as much or as little as you want in the shape that you want. These were gigantic, enormous slabs of rock that you take as is. You have to carry them as they are, and then you can cut them up. They were transported there. No one knows how. For reference again, this is way before the invention of the wheel way before the domestication of animals as recorded in history, as we know. This is way before the invention and the use of metals. So no one knows who these people were. 
And no one knows how these people built these structures. The only thing that is known about this entire site is that it was a temple. It was a place of worship and it was not a shelter. People did not live there. People traveled from other areas to come worship at that location and go back. That's all that is known based on the carvings, based on the findings, the archaeology that are on the site. By the way, for people who are interested in this type of stuff, it took 14 years to excavate 5% of this site. And then, since then, all excavation has stopped. In the last eight years, the World Economic Forum has entered into the equation and they erected buildings to make it into a touristic site, which also is destroying the area. And the area that was supposed to be for excavation is now entirely covered and being planted with trees. And no one knows why. The only statement that has come out regarding this site, the oldest known site to human beings, a gigantic site full of discoveries for human beings, is that we're going to leave it for future generations to excavate. We don't know what's going on. In any case, the point from all of this is what? is that when we study these types of findings, this type of archaeology, human history, it tells us that there is something universal in all human beings. That as soon as human beings are somewhere, one of the first things that they do is to erect a temple so that they can go and worship. So that they link back to the infinite and the supernatural. What we call God. That human beings need these rituals. And that human beings need these rituals in groups. Otherwise people can do all of this in their homes. They're going out of their way to erect these temples and these sites. Magnificent even by today's standards. The amount of time and energy and resources that it took to put all of this. This is one site. There are thousands of these. Wherever you find human beings, you will find these types of temples. This tells us a lot about our human nature. Throughout history, no matter where you look, your color, your race, your ethnicity, we all have the same basic human needs. We need to attend these temples, these mosques. We're designed this way. This is something that we crave instinctively. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us, created us with this drive. In any case, so this is simply to say that when we look at human history, even if we were to put aside the whole idea of religion, human history itself should be leading us back to the importance and perhaps the holiness of these types of buildings and sites. Quickly, let's turn our attention now to therefore. Therefore, what are the Islamic teachings around these sites? What are our duties and responsibilities and what are the Islamic recommendations about these types of sites like mosques? First teaching, I'm not going to go through the ahadith so that I can cover a lot more of them here. Otherwise the ahadith would take us a lot longer. So this is a summary of what we find in the ahadith. Ahlul Bayt salam say that we should all have an area in our own homes that is a mosque. They refer to it as a mosque, an area of worship. Dedicate an area of worship to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inside your homes. And they tell us in other hadith, they tell us Imam Ali alayhi salam had his own room even though the house of Imam Ali alayhi salam was stuck to the mosque. And that the Holy Prophet closed all the other doors that were stuck to the mosque, he sealed them. But he kept the door of Imam Ali alayhi salam and Fatimah al-Zahra open. If Imam Ali alayhi salam steps his foot outside the door, he is in the mosque. And yet Imam Ali alayhi salam still had a room in his house dedicated for his worship. And al-Bayt alayhi salam say there is nothing else in that room. It was an empty room for his prayer and he had a copy of the Qur'an in it. That's it. This is extremely important. 
This is good for our own spirituality, that you can retreat without distractions, and it shows your dedication to something. If you care about something, you're going to make space and time for it. Those who want to wa work with their hands, they have workshops in their homes. Those who care about working out will have a gym in their homes. If you care about worship and religion and your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you should have a dedicated spot. It doesn't need to be big. It could be the size of your prayer mat. But there is a spot for you. And that spot will be the constant reminder to go back and worship. And this is extremely important for family life. That children grow up in a world where they know that there is a dedicated spot and that religion is present in their lives. And this is also where the upbringing of the etiquette of the mosque starts. This is the mosque part of our house. This part has to be maintained. It has to be clean. It has to be pure. It has to remain beautiful. This is where we go to worship. So that when the child attends the mosque, they already know all this etiquette. This is simply a bigger space. Slightly different. But this is a mosque. No different than the one we have at home. Ensuring that Ahl al-Bayt tell us, we have to ensure that the mosques are used for their main purpose. That there is nothing happening in the mosques that hinders the purposes which we mentioned, the functions performed in mosques. And that includes excessive noise, any act of indecency, the cleanliness of the place, and the cleanliness of ourselves. Ahl al-Bayt talk about all of this. When you're attending, it shows what kind of importance you're giving to this place by the way you dress. Where are you attending? Who are you going to meet? We believe we're going in the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the house of God where God is remembered. We can't be sloppy. We can't be dirty. We have to look clean. And we have to maintain the cleanliness of the place which is unfortunately not always the case. Not in every mosque and not in every community. People don't always pick up after themselves. They leave their napkins, they leave their food, they leave their paper plates, and we leave our water bottles. It's an endemic issue, especially in Muharram. We had a whole lecture about water and the waste of water that happens. People are buying these. We have to make sure that we're not wasting it. If I pick up a bottle of water, I keep it and I use it. In any case, the cleanliness of the place, we have to ensure that it remains clean and beautiful. Ahl al-Bayt they say, we should put incense, bukhur, to perfume the place once a week. A place of worship should be always fragrant, smelling beautifully, looking beautifully. And there are people who can serve and perform these functions, whether in your home or in these places of worship. The place has to remain pure. This is a fiqhi obligation. This is not something that is recommended. If you know that there is a najasa or a source of najasa or a potential najasa, then it becomes obligatory to remove it in a place of worship. The hadith say that we have to avoid discussing or performing business. Keep buying and selling and business outside of the place of worship, Ahlul Bayt say. There's plenty of room for that. Don't buy and don't sell. Don't bring merchandise and don't discuss business in the place of worship. Do not allow batil to enter the place. Whatever batil means, whatever wrong Falsehood means do not let it to enter the place of worship. And there's a whole discussion, inshallah, we covered it enough. There's a whole discussion that we've had in the past about whether children should attend or not. Children should attend because this is the only way for them to learn about mosques. And this is the only way for them to learn about the etiquette of the mosque. And this is the only way for them to learn that this is a place where they are welcome that they feel like they are at home. They want to grow up in this type of place. No one is treating them harshly, disrespectfully. 
in a way that they don't want to go back. We want them to feel comfortable and happy coming to these places. And if they are too disruptive, it's up to us to plan it accordingly. So this does not become a hindrance for them or for the others. I won't say anything more about that. That requires its own discussion. The importance of attending in person, especially in today's world, in this digital age, where everything's available on your smartphone and on your screen and on your TV. Attend in person. You cannot replace the blessings and the importance of attending in person. There is a lot of thawab that is mentioned in numerous ahadith about your travel to the place of worship. There is a lot of reward given to sitting in the place of worship. There is a lot of reward given to waiting for the prayer. So you attend before the time of prayer as you wait for the prayer. You're not doing anything else. The Ruwayat say you receive a lot of rewards for this. This is about the philosophy of the place. Perform as many of your acts of worship in the place of worship. Especially in the company of others. But even though if it's alone, good enough. And this is where we open the door to a whole discussion that I don't want to have right now about the complaints. In the Ruwayat there are three that will complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of resurrection. The mosque is one of them. An empty mosque will complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that it was left empty. And with time, it starts to crumble because there, are no one, there is no one who is maintaining it. And the others that will complain in some ruwayat are the scholar in the group, in a group of ignorant people who don't understand the value of the scholar and the Qur'an. Literally, the ruwayat say the Qur'an that accumulates dust because it is not open enough for recitation. These will complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of resurrection. More teachings are about the importance of building mosques, maintaining mosques, and serving in mosques. The hadith tell us that this is your investment for the afterlife. Every dollar you put into these places is your own investment into your own account for the afterlife. Every minute you spend serving in these places is an investment that you're putting in your own account for the afterlife. No matter what that service looks like, whether you're building, whether you're helping, whether you're cleaning, whether you're cooking, whether you're contributing with dollar amounts, whatever it may be, this is your own account that you're putting into. You're investing into. Moving on. Always two quick teachings. Always perform as much as possible two raka'at whenever you enter a place of worship. Don't leave the place without at least having performed one small prayer. If you can perform others, great. If you have no prayers to perform, at least perform two raka'at. Make sure that your name is written in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as having performed a prayer in every place of worship that you've ever been. Every time you've entered, write your name down. You performed worship in this place, one. And two, this one is not mentioned in the ruwayat, I add it. Always give charity. Never leave the place without giving some charity. Even if it's 25 cents. Give something. Don't leave the place without having contributed to it. And once again, this is ensuring and guaranteeing that whatever state of worship, house of worship you step into, your name is registered as having been contributed to that. You will own a share of all the thawab that happens in this place. Forever. This place may exist for another 10,000 years with people worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in it. Now you own a share of that. You multiply the reward in your head and see what that gives you. Never leave a place without having contributed something. This needs to be part of how we raise our children so that it becomes automatic. I step into a place of worship, I contribute something. No matter what, no matter how small. Giving nothing is always less than giving a little. Give something, whatever it is based on your own means. 
And then there are spiritual recommendations. Ahlul Bayt salam tell us never step into a place while carrying injustice against others. And Imam Sadiq salam has a long hadith in which he says, as you approach the gate of the place, start to remember your sins and your shortcomings and your weaknesses. Talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and share your secrets to him, Imam Sadiq salam says. And stand at the door like a hopeless servant, the Imam says, waiting for the permission of God to enter your heart. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has invited you into his home. And if it doesn't come, the Imam says, recite the verse and repeat it. Oh, the one who answers the prayers of the distressed when they are in need. This is the state that Imam Sadiq says, our spiritual state when we enter the places of worship. This is all regarding, in general, the general mosques. And then we have specific indications about specific locations, specific mosques. We mentioned the Kaaba. The house and the mosque and the grave of the Holy Prophet is another one where there are many narrations. Masjid al-Kufa is an incredible site that used to be the house of many of the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many of them lived there as their house. And then it became a mosque. And this is a tradition. The Holy Quran talks about prophets who turn their houses into, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands them to turn their houses into qiblah, into a place of worship or a direction of worship. In the case of Musa and his brother alayhi salam, Harun. So we have these special places that have a special type of holiness, a special type of sanctity. And of course, we are told in the ruwayat that another place of special holiness and sanctity is wherever martyrs are buried. People who have died in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless the areas that they're in and those areas become holy. Which brings us to Karbala. In the narrations, if you go back, you see that the narrations say that all the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have gone through Karbala. And if you analyze these narrations, it looks like they were performing two functions. The first function that all the prophets performed in Karbala is that they try to receive an acceleration of their spiritual growth. The time that it takes you to grow spiritually is shortened in Karbala. That's my way of summarizing the issue. And so what they would achieve in a much longer period of time, they achieve in a very short period of time in Karbala. Secondly, they mourn Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. They cry and weep and remember Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. There are too many narrations to mention about this. Too many narrations mentioned about each one of the prophets and what they did. And perhaps these two functions are not separate. That mourning Imam al Hussein alayhi salam has something to do with our spiritual growth. In the ruwayat, if I take one example, in the ruwayat we are told. In the Quran, it says the story of Prophet Musa alayhi salam. What does it say? That after he left Median, he left with his wife and some sheep and he traveled. And at some point, he was in the middle of the night. It was a cold night. It was a rainy night in the middle of a storm. He lost all his sheep. His wife is pregnant and he is lost in the desert. And then he sees light. And he thinks that it's fire. And so he asks his wife to wait so that he may go see perhaps it's fire. He may take a piece of it and bring back to warm themselves. And he doesn't take her with him out of chastity in case there are men there. He doesn't want them to see her. A message for us brothers and for the sisters. Prophet Musa salam walks to the fire alone and he finds out that it's not a fire. That it's a tree 
from which there is light emanating. And then, then he is called. And there are multiple verses of the Quran talking about this. They say that this is a blessed spot. Blessed whoever is in the spot. And blessed whoever is around it. This is a blessed spot. Another verse is even stronger. Remove your sandals. You are in a sacred location, in a sacred valley. Either called Tuwa or described as Tuwa. Whatever that means, we leave for another day. You go back to the ruwayat of Ahl al-Bayt and all the ruwayat say that this was Karbala. Prophet Musa السلام, was in Karbala when this happened. All the ruwayat. But usually we don't go back to the ruwayat of Ahl al-Bayt. So we don't know this. What happened to Musa in Karbala? He became a prophet and a messenger. And he was sent with a mission. And he received his first miracles. And he received the guidance and the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the first function. And we said, and we know, and we have the ruwayat that talk about his mourning of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam in Karbala as well. What is the link with Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam? Perhaps, and we don't know, and this is heart-wrenching to say, but perhaps it is Imam Hussein alayhi salam who transformed that area of the world. In our ruwayat, in the maqtal, we are told that Imam Hussein alayhi salam was beheaded from the back, from behind his neck. The state in which he left the world was with his forehead and his face on the ground in prostration to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that state, we know the exact words the Imam was saying and uttering. They are mentioned in the maqatil. In his last state and in his last moments as he left this world, Imam Hussein alayhi salam made the spot in which his body fell, the spot in which his blood flowed, he transformed it into a masjid, a place where his forehead rests in worship and remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Transforming that land into the holiest and the most blessed of areas. And this was shared with the prophets. And this is where they were coming. And this is part of the blessing of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam in that land. The effect of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam on that land. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that if these are the types of effects that the prophets can gain and the benefits that they get from associating themselves with Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam. This is the transformative power of Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam. Then we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be of those who benefit a little bit at least from associating with Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam in this way and remembering Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam in this way. And this is perhaps why the next time you perform the ziyarah of Imam al-Hussein, inshallah every day we are all reading and reciting ziyarat Ashura from all the ma'sumin who have the ziyarat, there's only one ziyarah that has a sujood in it. The next time you perform the sujood in ziyarat Ashura, remember Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and this state of holiness and sanctity and sacredness in which he left the world. Assalamu alaikum ya Aba Abdullah, Assalamu ala al Hussein, wa ala Ali ibn al Hussein, wa ala awlad al Hussein, wa ala ashab al Hussein. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين